And I kept telling him, somebody needs to do a documentary about you. And he was going to come out with his memoir. And I said, you know, I think it's me. And so I started working on a documentary. I learned how to make a documentary in the end. Uh, and I've now completed a second one as well that's, that, that's about to come out, uh, COVID willing. It's, it's delayed it quite a bit. Uh, but he's a fascinating guy, and I was really interested in his story. And I didn't really know how the movie's going to end. And I'm not really particularly blowing the ending for people, but I realized that the message of the movie was one of resilience, of keeping doing it. And Gary pretty much directly says that at one point in the movie. You know, find something you like to do and do it until you die. Uh, and, he, and Gary's 87 and he's still doing it. So, and Gary's right here, yeah. Before you go any further, the first part of that did not record. So for those of oh. you just joining, I'm going to repeat myself, but this is Kathy Murphy. I'm um, here tonight with a pre-show on the Pulp of Queen Film Club with Joe O'Connell who is a documentary filmmaker, he's a journalist, and uh, he's got a very special guest. He's got Gary Kent, who's the star of his documentary, Danger God. So if you didn't catch the first part of that, I just wanted to jump in and re you know make sure that everybody knows what they're watching, and then I'll let you continue, Joe, with your story, okay? okay. Yeah, I was, I was just talking about meeting Gary, uh, and meeting him uh, 20 years ago. And I was uh, at an agent's conference, and Gary was there hawking his memoir, trying to find an agent for it. And I met him and thought he was fascinating. He told me about the movies he'd worked in, B-movies, as a stuntman, an actor. And I went out immediately and rented uh, a movie called Satan Sadus, in which he is the good guy Vietnam vet. It's an Al Adamson film. Uh, and it's a great, it's a great uh, movie, great biker film. And I went home and I told my then girlfriend, now wife, that I got to find this guy and write about it. I, I was a film columnist, 12 years combined for the Austin American Statesman, Austin Chronicle, and Dallas Morning News. And, uh, you know, I, and I found him, wrote about him, we became friends. And I kept saying that somebody needs to do a documentary about you. And then that memoir, he was finally coming out with it. And I said, okay, I guess it's me. And I had to learn how to do a, do a documentary, how to make one. I was already a fiction writer and a journalist, so I know story. And, uh, you know, and I was interested in him. And the thing that came through was the message that came through to me was one of resilience. That Gary was a guy who lived life fully. His belief was, and he says it at one point in the documentary, find something you like to do in life and do it till you die. He's 87 years old and he's still doing it, so. Uh, Gary, I agree with you 100%. I'm the same way when it comes to um, sharing stories, whether it be film or whether it be books, it's all about the story. So Gary, how are you doing tonight? Hi, Kat. Hey, Kathy, how are you doing? I'm, I'm hanging in there. <laughs> good. That's good to hear, good to hear. And good to be on your show, Kathy. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about, um, kind of set the tone for what we're going to see tonight with The Danger God. Uh, where'd you get the title, by the way? Well, my original title for the film was Love and Other Stunts. And then we went to the distributor and they said, oh, they love the movie, but not the title. Yeah. What else you got? And I, they said, give us some options. And I gave them three options. Gary had gone to the Alma Draft House in Austin yeah. for a big festival of stunts. And he was on a panel and they did stunts. They flipped cars and stuff is in the, in the documentary. And that event was called Danger Gods. And so I said, okay, that's an option, but just Danger God, because it's just Gary. Yeah. And they looked at that and said, all right, Danger God. We like that. Uh, I believe we should give credit where credit's due. Zach Carlson at the Draft House is the one who came up with Danger Gods. That's a wonderful yeah. place to watch the movies, too. Yeah, it is. It's a great I place. Yeah. Place. Yeah. So you're very lucky. So quite a life, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, uh, I'm very grateful for, for not only the career I had, but for the many, many years I. 
I got to do it. So there you go. I'm still here. You certainly are. And um, it's so funny because you always hear about um, uh, young men wanting to become musicians because they get all the girls. But I don't know, kind of looked to me like the stuntmen did pretty well, too, with uh, um, you <laughs> quite, the, quite, the, quite the macho men, man. Looked like you were yeah. doing pretty well that way, too. I have no complaints. You're <laughs> absolutely right. Hmm. Uh, one of the things that I found fascinating about the film was, first of all, how really dangerous a lot of the things that you did were. This was before, you know, they have all these new technologies that where people don't actually have to do these jumps or leaps or motorcycle tricks or car wrecks or rollovers. Uh, what, what do you think really made you... Uh, pursue this career as a stuntman? What was the one, can you think of one thing in particular that just made you go, this is for me? Uh, sure, a, a lot of things, but one thing, let me see. Uh, it was the, the uh, problem of doing a stunt, solving it for a motion picture. They all, the directors uh, frequently had no idea how to do action. So they left it up to the stuntmen or the stunt coordinators to figure out the car roll or the chase or whatever was going to happen, the high fall. And so they would leave it up to you. And it was that thrill of having to be a part of a film and getting to figure it out myself, how to do a particular thing that is going to look really, really dangerous, but try not to hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. So when when a stunt is done on a movie, I mean, even even the love scenes, a lot of times the crew is just bored. They've been on the film forever and they could care less. But when it comes time to do a stunt, everybody shows up to watch it. And so it was that kind of feeling that I was doing. I was adding something really important to the film that no one else could do but stunt people. Right, right. And learning how to drive like that, you know, and where they can do cars up on the side. I don't know how they do. You know, I was kind of a Mario Andretti back in my high school days, but I don't do that anymore. <laughs> well, you can, you can see behind me Gary doing a stunt. And uh, what's this movie called, Gary? With the flaming car flipping in the air. I think it's Gun of Dragon, isn't it? Gun of Dragon, yeah. Dragon. That's Gary inside that show. car. Went to many of these movies when I was uh, uh, in high school, and uh, they were very popular with the boys. Yeah. And, uh, ah. and they still are. They ah. still are. Good. You know, I think Tom Cruise has made a fortune off of all the crazy stunts that he's done with his Mission Impossible things. And... Um, What's the craziest stunt that you think you ever did? Oh, golly, the craziest stunt. I've done so many. Um, well, I'll, I'll just say there was a picture I did called Psych Out, directed by my favorite director, Richard Rush. And Psych Out starred Jack Nicholson and Max Julian and, and several other people. But in that film, I had to do a bunch of stunts and a bunch of firework and uh, figuring out how to do this uh, where Susan Strasberg is given acid by mistake and she goes on an acid trip running around the streets of San Francisco, not, not knowing what happened to her. She's just seeing all of these strange things happen that were fire. She, it wasn't really fire, but what she was seeing yeah. in her mind was fire and so i got to do and it ends with this tremendous stunt at the end of it uh, so i got to figure out how to do the firework this was before cgi as you mentioned yeah. cgi uh computer graphics now they just put in all the stuff in the background and you don't have to really do it they do it by computer but back then we had to really do it so i had to figure out this fire trip of a girl running around the streets of San Francisco, seeing monsters that are fire, uh, cars coming on fire toward her on the Bay Bridge, all of these, 
So I got to figure all of that out, how to do it, and then do a car hit at the end of the fire trip where uh, she's on the freeway and all these cars are coming. And uh, one of the actors runs out and shoves her out of the way before she gets hit. And then he gets hit. So I did that stunt. I not only did the firework, but I got hit by the car and bounced from the car onto a truck and from the side of a truck onto another car. And then from that car onto the Bay Bridge where I hit my head and it uh, kills me. But that was probably because it was such a long sequence and it worked so well. That was probably the weirdest thing I've done that I'm so proud of. Well, were, were you, explain to the audience, were you hurt? I mean, I mean how could you not be hurt? Uh, well, thank you. No, I was not hurt. I had, um, I had a, most of the time when you're going to do a stunt, you figure out way ahead of time what you're going to do. And then by the time you get ready to do it, you forget all about all whether you get hurt or not. And all you do is concentrate really heavy duty on what you're going to do so that you try to eliminate all chances of getting hurt before, before you do it. However, I have been hurt uh, as most anybody that's done stunts for the many years that I did has been hurt a few times, but mostly you get rid of all the things that can hurt you in your mind ahead of time so that when you do it, you know exactly what you're doing, you know exactly the timing, and hopefully you're agile enough or experienced enough you can pull it off without injury. Well, you've got to work with some pretty famous people. I mean, Jack Nicholson, my goodness. Uh, who was your uh, uh, favorite star to work with and, and any great stories you want to share with the audience on some of those interactions? I, I would have to say, uh, first off, Jack Nicholson. Yes. I really like Jack. I did five films doubling, doubling Jack, and he was just a great guy to work with. Uh, I just remember one of the first times I met him on it. We were doing two westerns up in Utah, and uh, Jack was playing a bad guy that was a good, good guy on horseback. But he was not that experienced with horses. So when he got off the horse, he always looked down at the ground to see where he was going to step, which made him look very amateurish. And I said, don't look down at the ground. Just step off the horse looking straight ahead like you know where you're going. Otherwise, it looks like you're stepping in a pile of horse manure. Right. And Jack sort of laughed. And then from then on, he did exactly what I said including on the uh, picture psych out there is a fight that takes place in a swimming pool and uh, the, an empty swimming pool it starts on the top of the pool a bunch of bikers and and rednecks get in a fight and they end up down in the in the empty swimming pool and jack said gary i want you to watch me he came to the edge of the pool where he had to jump in and fight a guy in the bottom pool, but he looked, didn't look down. He looked straight ahead and just jumped. And I thought, oh no, that's not what I meant. So <laughs> when you're going to go in a swimming pool 10 feet down, you better look where you're going. Oh, but he did it. And, uh, and he was very proud of the fact that he did exactly what I told him to do. That's amazing. That's really amazing. One yeah. of the things that really struck me when I watched the film was the uh, the you were talking about doing the some films and some shootings on the ranch out in the middle of the high desert, uh, the place where Manson was holed up with all these, you know, um, in these kind of dilapidated. It was like an old ghost town, or what was the story on that? And and uh, what was your? Uh, uh, you got to actually meet him, right? Correct, Charles Manson. Absolutely, absolutely, I did. Uh, yes, you're talking about the Spawn Ranch. It was an old, dilapidated movie ranch that uh, people could come and shoot there on the cheap. He had a, a bunch of horses. He would rent out a George Spawn, the owner, who was blind, by the way. Uh, would rent out the ranch to uh, motion picture companies to shoot their films if anything was uh, 
time zone. So if it was like in the 20s or 30s, there were no TV antennas, there were no modern cars, there was just, you know, empty space out there in a bunch of dilapidated old buildings. So I shot several films out there. And in doing so, I met uh, Charles Manson because he lived there with his girls. He called them the creepy crawlies. And they lived there, they would come and watch the shooting when you were shooting a movie and they would bake your lunches from you. You know, can I have your cupcake? Can I have your sandwich? They were always hungry and we just thought they were a bunch of hippies that were hanging out there. Um, mm -hmm. And we had a dune buggy that broke down and, and belonged to a friend of mine named Bud Cardos. And so I asked one of the girls, I think it was Krenwinkel, I said, well, do you know where I could get a good mechanic around here to fix this buggy? And she said, we've got a great mechanic. His name's Charlie Manson. So she went and got Charlie and brought him down. And I met him, he was just this little guy, uh, Kathy, just five foot five, maybe, if that. Uh, and he didn't look hypnotic at all. He just looked like he needed a good bath and, uh, and a sandwich or something. But he, uh, he said he needed $70 up front to fix the dune buggy. So Bud gave him $70. We came back the next day. The dune buggy was not fixed. Mm -hmm. So I said, give me Charlie Manson. They went and got Charlie and he came over again. And I said, Charlie, you better fix this dune buggy because Bud Cardos is a tough guy and he's going to rearrange your nether region. That's not the word I use, but I'll, I'll be safe and say that for you now. He's going to, Bud Cardos is going to arrange you a new, a new nether region if you don't fix this. So Charlie got under the dune buggy and fixed it right away. Uh, and it ran. He, he didn't look hypnotic at all. He was just, he looked like a shoplifter, Kathy. He was always looking down at the ground and then, then he'd look up at you kind of sideways to see if you were uh, scoping him out. He was just kind of a creepy little guy. His eyes are really creepy. If you're looking at the screen right now, everybody, this is Gary back in the day behind Joe. Joe's been uh, changing out the photos from the movie and uh, you were quite the handsome hunkaroony there, you know. Um, I imagine that um, there were a lot of uh, women around go watching these films and stuff too? Or um, uh, was it mostly just the guys just all hanging out and having guy time? It was both. Uh, yes, there were a, a lot of women, but, but uh, the stunt guys are a strange breed and they sort of hung together. So, uh, and, and when you showed up on a motion picture, everybody was aware, here come the stunt crew. So you had kind of a, uh, being sort of special in a way, if I may say that. Uh, so you had your fans that would come and hang around and watch what you were going to do. And along with that went the perks of being popular, whatever you do, whether you're a singer or a stuntman or a, a director, whatever, actor, uh, it had its perks. And one of them was that people weren't really aware of how you did what you were doing. They just admired it a lot. So yeah, we had our fans and some of them were women. Yeah, but the women in the films, uh, you know, the storylines for some of your films, these are not always films that you see nominated for the Academy Award, but these are popular films. And they were popular in the day because men wanted to see, um, you know, action. You know, a lot of a lot of action, a lot of stunts, a lot of things, and I think they still do today. Um, you know, you you have created a a legacy that will, I think, in the future will be um, probably even more revered than it maybe even was at the time, because you did it uh, all with the CGI, so. you know, with all the CGI, and uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, I have, I had a friend that was a race car driver, you know, stock car racer. And, you know, that's a certain type of person too, a personality because you, you guys are fearless. I mean, how do you, were, you were kind of fearless as a child. Am I correct? Well, I, fearless is a good word. Uh, another word is stupid. And I, I'm not <laughs> sure which of those is the more pertinent, but, but yeah, I like to do, uh, 
I always like to do action. In fact, my first stunt was uh, I rode my tricycle down the cellar stairs and broke my arm. I think I was like two or three years old. So that sort of started my uh, my stunt career. Wow. Well, I've kind of done it, but I, I, I'm Calamity Jane. I can fall walking up the stairs, but I never in any realm of being ever thought about being a stunt person. I just haven't, and, but I've never had a broken bone that I know of. So uh, anyway, well, Joe, what was the most uh, 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 interesting part of learning this film process and doing this story from your perspective? Just learning how to tell that the story well. And here's the deal is, is my, I've got a second documentary done named Rondo and Bob. That's about the, the art director and the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Robert oh my. Burnham, and, and he was obsessed with Rondo Hatton, who uh, was a classic cult actor who had acromegaly. So he had particular appearance, both with that film and with Danger God, I'm less interested in the movies than I am with the person. Yeah, the, it's, it's the a story, story that makes it so interesting to me that how people fall into, I had um, an author, I don't know if you've ever heard of Ronnie Claire Edwards, but she was an actress. She played Corbeth Godsey on the Waltons, but she started yeah. out as a knife thrower's apprentice. Really? She joined a tent show when she was in high school. I can't believe her parents let her do this. And she went up into the high timber country in the Pacific Northwest. And she was the girl that would get on the spinning wheel while the knife thrower would throw the knives. And I, when I read this book, I thought, I've got to meet this woman. And she actually came and spent a week for me. She um, um, was the product of a DA from Oklahoma City and the... Uh, her mother was one of those romance magazine writers that they used to have back in the 40s. But um, Ronnie Claire Edwards was a trip, man. And, um, uh, but she lived in Los Angeles. And I, I agree. The story of Gary, the story of Ronnie, the story of people that do these unusual things, whether you're a contortionist or whether you're, uh, you know, a stuntman. Uh, it's amazing. Now, a lot of these guys that you hung out with, you still hang out with today. Is that correct, Gary? That is correct. I've got good friends that I worked with 40 years ago, and we're still buddies, and we still talk all the time. Do you all live down in Austin, or are you all spread out? We're all spread out. So when you get together, is it for conventions? Are there specific things that you guys car shows or things that you go to that you meet or where would people find you if you were ever got out and you were with your friends usually it's conventions uh sometimes it's a stunt convention or uh just recently i worked uh, a lot for a director named al adamson uh who made a ton of low budget movies but but has a great reputation and he just they just did an homage to al in hollywood several months ago and they flew a bunch of the stunt people that worked for Al because Al always had a lot of action in his films so they flew us all to uh to LA for that for that homage where they showed a documentary about Al and they flew front stunt people from Florida and from uh way outside of LA from Idaho and then me from Texas so I got to meet up with uh, with a lot of my buddies that I hadn't seen for a couple of years. It's so well, great because now question, that's it. Usually conventions and things like that. Once in a while we'll get together just just because we're buddies. Yeah. And that includes Bud Cardos, who's in the photo that you see behind me. Yeah. Who's, he's who's got good. that. that yeah, he's a, he's a badass. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, it's all fascinating to me. So, um, so do you have anybody in your family that has um, inherited this wild uh, stuntman uh, legacy? Do you have any uh, children or um, grandchildren that have uh, been fascinated with what the, you've done or is it stopping with you? Well, it kind of stopped. Stop with me. I do have uh, six children, five five sons. Uh, none of them went into uh, stunt work, 
but uh, they tried it. A couple of them tried it and got hurt right away and said, no, that's not for them. Uh, but a couple of them did get into show business. My oldest son, Greg, is a, a great actor, producer, director uh, of stage shows. Uh, so a couple of them have gotten into the business, but not doing stunts. Yeah, well, that takes a special person, you know, to take that on. So it's a fascinating story. And I know we're all going to have a good time watching it again tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Joe, is there anything you want? We'll talk some more about your other films later that oh, are sure. coming up in your books, because I'd love to talk to you about it. But is there anything as we wrap this up that you want to share with everybody, both of you on... Um, the film and, uh, um, you know, you've taken it around to film festivals, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, it's out. It's out on, on DVD and Blu-ray and, uh, you know, streaming on, on most of the streaming services. Sure. Uh, Amazon Prime. And Have you taken it to the Nacogdoches Film Festival? I didn't even know there was one. Oh my gosh, they've got a film school now at SFA. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I've actually gone there and spoke. Uh, you need to all connect you with them. Okay. They do. They have a great film festival. And my friend, Elisa Steed, is on that board. So that would be a great place for you to go because they've got all these guys. Now, they're doing a lot of horror films and stuff. Oh, the, you know, that's the big thing for the kids today. But... Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, that would be a good one. And, you know, there was one in Shreveport, Bossier. They did a documentary on my girlfriend weekend, uh, a filmmaker by the name of Bill Torgerson uh, from New York. And it won the Audience Choice Award at the International Phenom Film Festival in Shreveport, Bossier. But I don't, I think everything's on hold. I mean, yeah. until this COVID thing's over, you guys, yeah. um, it's going to be doing stuff like this so for yeah. any future projects reach out to me love to have you back on gary you take good care i'm i am so impressed with you and um i know you've had some recent health issues so you're recuperating and i appreciate you being on tonight i i cannot believe it but then i can after i saw everything you did in the film so thank you uh thank you kathy i would like to mention uh I also have a book, which is in its third printing now, called Shadows and Light, Journeys with Outlaws in Revolutionary Hollywood. Okay. And it's uh, gotten like 95% rave reviews, uh, but it covers the motion picture industry and especially stunts during the 60s, 70s, 80s, up, up almost till now. And so if anyone wants that book, they can get it. Um, from the publisher or from me on my uh, timeline on Facebook. Just go on Facebook, Gary Warner Kent, and message me, okay. and I'll make sure they get a they get that book. It's it's I, I think really a fascinating book about the industry. When I post this onto my Kathy L. Murphy YouTube channel. I'll be sure and mention that, where they can get the book. And you know what I love about oh, that? You. I used to go and read um, at these juvenile detention centers and different things. And your book is the kind of book where for kids that are on the cusp of, um, of you know, life choices, something like this, oh that could get them reading about something that is exciting to them, that's dangerous, but in a good way. This would be a great book to share with, uh, uh, you know, those reluctant readers and those boys that don't want to read, because I don't know any boy that doesn't love to hear about stunts and cars and, and fire. And I mean, you know, just, um, I like them myself. I have to admit, I do. So I'm a big Western fan too. So I grew up on Western. So I will be sure and mention that. Joe will be in touch to talk about this next um, book. And um, anyway, um, you guys, what's the last things you want to share with everybody on your story? <laughs> That's tough. What do you got to say, Gary? I just, uh... All I've got to say is keep smiling.
keep going, keep smiling, and uh, spread the love. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Thank you, yeah. Gary. Those are important you words. Realize that the movie gets very personal in, in, the, in the second half. Yes, so it does. don't be surprised when that suddenly happens. <laughs> it's by well, plan. You know, as the Pulpwood Queen, I run, I run, Gary, the largest meeting and discussing book club now in the world. It's an international book club with almost 800 chapters, and we're in 15 foreign countries. And uh, when I wow, pick up, wow. yeah, I know, when I pick books, what I look for is it's got to be about the story. Because, you know, you can fix the editing, you can fix the... Um, a lot of different things, but I'm looking for the story that's not been told, and you just told one, and I think it's going to touch uh -huh. a lot of people, and I think you're going to get a lot of people reading and watching this film that may have not picked up a book in a long time, but um, it just goes to show you that, um, you know, we need to share the stories, and that's what the Pulp of Queen Film Club is. It's sharing the story behind the stories of our authors, their books, and the people that are finding their true passions in life. And uh, you kind of are heroes because, um, you know, a lot of people think it's um, the people who become powerful and rich doesn't interest me. But if I can find somebody who's found uh, their true calling in life and they throw their whole selves into it, that's the story I want to hear. And thank you for sharing it tonight. Good for you. Good for you, Kathy. That thank is so you. important. Well, I'm going to uh, say goodnight. I'm going to let you guys uh, um, recover from this crazy venture. I'm, it'll be downloading. And as soon as it gets downloaded, I will put it up on my uh, Kathy L. Murphy uh, YouTube channel. Please subscribe, tell all your friends, and then you guys will be able to have it forever. You can share it. It will actually, I do it so that it premieres when I play, when I download it, so that um, the more people that come on board, the more people are going to see it. So uh, thank you for joining us at the movies, and I applaud both of you for a great story tonight. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all, you. and until next time, keep going, Gary. Keep going, Joe. Thanks. You got okay. it. You got it. Night. I'm going to end the meeting if I can get my little, I'm having a little bit of internet thing, but bye-bye, y'all. Bye. Bye-bye.